Now, uh, as we said in part number one of our study, uh, we went to a particular conference, and again, to be fair, there's a lot of good, and uh, as a matter of fact, there's a lot of good Bible study uh, involving uh, the ministry that uh, was uh, the, the one that put on this conference. Very, very good, and we're glad for that. We're not at all disapproving of those areas that shed light on the Word of God and that we believe it is accurate. But on the other hand, there is an aspect to this particular ministry uh, that uh, we fear. And uh, the fear is uh, what we would call Christian activism. Now, it's not that we're not to be actively Christian. Uh, that's, that's one thing. Uh, but that involves our personal spirituality and, and spiritual maturity uh, where we are, not just inside of church, but outside of church. Whether it's at home, whether it's on the job, uh, whether it's at play and socializing, whatever, it's our own personal testimony. And uh, where we witness and try to evangelize and try to share the Word of God with others. But when it comes to forcing others, taking away their freedom, and forcing others to, um, to try to be spiritual apart from salvation, to try to be spiritual apart from spirit filling, uh, to attempt to fulfill God's plan and program apart from an understanding of, of doctrine, which of course, the natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. And what we're doing is more or less uh, kicking a dead horse, uh, beating somebody over the head uh, who does not understand. The best of men are men at their best, and they can only achieve a certain level and measure of morality, but never spirituality, unless it is actually God's system. And so when we as grace believers begin to uh, approach the governing system of our land, the unbelievers of our land and say, you're going to do this and you're going to do the other and you're going to fulfill the plan and program of God, then we're, we're in for trouble because we're starting from the outside working in rather than where God starts. And that is what we've been studying on Wednesday night and one Sunday night, the doctrine of evil. Uh, men can be good uh, in, a, in a measure, but if you're unsaved, Every good work that is done is going to be burned because it's evil. Whether it's from the uh, immoral side of the sin nature or the moral side, the irre irreligious side or the religious side, it's still all evil, and evil works are all going to be burned. Well, where do you start then with human goodness that is acceptable to God? Salvation. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's step number one. And then with the other things that we've been developing. Uh, and so to us, it is the cart before the horse type deal when, when we begin to, to demand that unbelievers fulfill the will of God, do it like God wants them to uh, in, in the dispensation of grace, apart from these things. It's just never going to happen. It'll never be acceptable to God, and we're never, America is never going to be um, a, a righteous nation. That's just it. We'll never be a Christian nation, and should not be. Now, there should be Christians in our nation, absolutely. But to Christianize America apart from evangelizing America is uh, just the same old legalistic attempt to bring in the kingdom before Christ gets here. Now, we went down uh, a list of uh, the things that uh, this particular person started uh, going through the alphabet, and we ended on feminism. Now, one of the reasons that uh, this uh, particular man hits on feminism is because of a movement that he is associated with, and it's called the homeschooling movement, in fact. That is letter H. We're on F, the next is guns, the next is homeschooling. And uh, with the, this matter of feminism, he absolutely ridiculed the public school system. And more or less, in, in his talk, you, you get the impression, and this is what he said, when he was growing up, all of his teachers taught him to fornicate, I'm using his words, 
all of his teachers to told him how to use condoms. Okay? Now, I think back to my own public school days. And you know what? I didn't see one homosexual there. <laughs> I didn't have any of my teachers ever, ever talk to me about that except in health class. And that was with, uh, with uh, Coach Hank. And he mainly, mainly showed films because uh, even big, tough Coach Hank was a little <laughs> uh, ashamed, you know, a little bashful to, to talk about uh, that uh, amongst the men back in, in those days. Uh, there were married teachers there. They had a great measure of, of professionalism. Uh, and you, you didn't, I didn't see any of that. And I was thinking, man, I, I thought, you know, I must not be leading a normal life. I, you want to go to those high schools where that's all this sex is going on. And you think to yourself, nonsense. It's not happening. Uh, it's, uh, it's just to make, it's just to demonize something. Yes, there are things wrong with, with the public school system. Yes, I'm sure. Just like with any profession, you've got your good teachers and your bad teachers. But uh, you've got that anywhere, as I said. But generally speaking, the public school system has a tougher job than the home school system. We've got uh, the entire community coming here, and so there has to be different approaches and the like. But the statement that was made was that the reason we've gone to homeschooling is for the socialization of kids. The academic excellence is secondary. I think to myself of all the homeschoolers that I know, most of them are single, are not single moms, but single student with the mom there. Just, it's just a single student. Now, who is this student doing all this socializing with? It's mama who pampers him. That's what it is. He's not in the, the, the mix of, of the tough kids and the, and the others and, and uh, the, the, uh, the girls that are smarter than he is in math class uh, that you try to make friends with so you make good grades and cheat off their papers and, and that, that sort of thing. I mean, he's not in that particular mix. He is there at home with mom, pampered, and so he gets his favorite breakfast, his favorite lunch, and his favorite dinner, and, and uh, all these breaks. Now, I'm not saying that some of them don't work hard. Yes, that's true. They do, uh, some of them work hard, but some of them are pampered. But as far as socialization, what, about once every quarter, all of the homeschoolers get together at one, one church and they, they uh, compete? That is not socialization. Socialization is Monday through Friday getting up every day according to the real world routine and facing unbelievers, the good and the bad, and mixing it up in their rubbing shoulder to shoulder and, and idea to idea and, and, and competing in that particular arena. Now there's socialization and there is life. Uh, to me, it's just the old monastic system. We're, we're going to have a, a cloistered uh, society there, and we're not going to be worldly because we're, we've moved away from the world and we've built a wall so they can't get to us. And that is nonsense. Because I think of us. Who here was homeschooled? You and I are a product of what? The public school system. And uh, I, I don't think uh, I don't think we've turned out all that bad. Now again, that doesn't mean that there's there's not room for fixing. There's not room for for criticism. There's not room for say. But but we are in the United States of America, a free country where people of other ideas are are there, and they are just as much part of that system. We are in the world. It's just that we are not of the world. And the problem that I see, the, 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 we're talking about socialization, is that uh, the homeschoolers are never in the world. They never learn what it's like to get out there and have to have to look eyeball to eyeball and to that of an unbeliever and uh, and and try to get things accomplished to to each other's satisfaction. And that never happens in the home. But let me tell you, the public schools were absolutely uh, ridicule. And to me, probably, they get their idea of public schools from, from television. Now, I think that the media has caused a lot of problems in the public school. For example, what's one of the television programs that's touted as uh, 
very entertaining, very, you know, helpful is Boston Public. Now, are public schools really like Boston Public? Maybe Boston Public is. But the schools that I, I know of are not like Boston Public. Maybe some of the inner city schools and, and that sort of thing. But the majority of public schools are simply not like that. What they're doing is trying to make our public schools like that by, by holding up these uh, people as, uh, as role models to bring back into the public schools just as troublemakers. But the majority are not like that. And, uh, and uh, uh, any, any uh, illegal things would be taken care of uh, and that sort of thing. But, but here's how, why uh, he has the, the feminism because it's connected with the homeschooling. In many cases, the moms of the homeschoolers are not certified and qualified with an educational background to teach those kids. So here you have women without the work put in to be qualified to teach in a particular area, uh, uh, academic area, teaching kids and then saying, and that's the, that was the, uh, the boast, these kids have 30% greater academic standards than anybody in the public school. And I don't believe it. I don't believe that's true. Uh, and maybe somebody could, could, uh, could enlighten me on that, but I don't believe that's true. Yes, maybe in certain areas uh, the, they do excel, but again, they get a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention, you know that? And it's, it's just there so that they can spend all morning on it if, if, you, if uh, the mom wants all morning on a subject. But, um, but this mom, unless she has had the educational background, is not versed in linguistics, is not versed in mathematics, is not versed in history, is not versed in geography, is not versed in biology. And, and on and on we could go, where, where when you come to a public school, you have people, especially in the, in the uh, uh, higher levels, that are specialized in those areas. And that's why, uh, despite the problems, we think that, that the public school system is, uh, is not all that bad, especially because we have, we have a couple public school teachers here. <laughs> but that's not the reason that I'm saying that. I'm saying that in all fairness in counting the, the two systems. I've always said that. Uh, it, is, it is taking people in an unreal world to teach them. That's not the real world. Uh, and uh, socialization first and academic second, nonsense. Unless you have brothers and sisters, you're not socializing, and even then, it's not the same. Uh, it's not the same because mama is there and, and she is able to, uh, to tell brother or sister certain things. But in a public school where you have all mixes there, it's quite a, a different story. So anyway, the feminism. What he wants is for women not to work at all. And he pretty much downplayed and ridiculed women working. Now, as I said to, to you this morning, I wondered where in, in this particular church, where in the world the women, uh, why they didn't stand up. I know the women there. One uh, uh, works for a dentist, uh, I think is a, uh, is a hygienist. Uh, one works for a, a particular military base there and is a, a high up as a, as a supervisor with people under her and, uh, and on and on where you have women working. None of them said, wait, what, what do you mean? We don't, we don't get equal pay. But what do you mean women are not supposed, supposed to work? Now, uh, uh, the reason that this fellow does not understand it is because of the uh, a misunderstanding of the ten institutes of divine establishment. He only chose three. He said God had only ordained three institutes, and that was uh, marriage, uh, and family, and church. Uh, okay. Now, there are ten institutes that God has. When you come through the line to the first few, where, where itself, it is a sexual orientation. You're either a man or a woman. That determines whether in the marriage you're a husband or a wife. That determines whether you're a father or a mother. That determines whether you're a pastor or uh, um, a uh, parishioner, a, a, a church member. 
because pastors are all males. But once you get to the other four, the last four, it doesn't matter your sexual gender. And the last four are school, business, military, and nation. Now, um, a lady from the past administration was brought up, Janet Reno. Now, I didn't like Janet Reno. I didn't like her politics. I thought she was crooked in many ways. Uh, and I thought she was appointed to that post for that reason, to uh, allow the president and others to do what they wanted to do and yet never prosecute them and never charge them and the like. However, if Janet Reno would have told me in her capacity and I was submissive, uh, was under her authority, I'd say yes ma'am. You see, they say that we're not supposed to do that sort of thing. I have to say yes ma'am. Uh, and uh, it, it, it would not matter why. She's in that position, she has been duly authorized, and if she says it, that's the way it is because she is God's servant, as ungodly as I think she was. She is still God's servant, ministering to keep law and, and order, a basic law and order here. So, they're totally against uh, women working, and especially advancing, especially learning, uh, especially competing uh, with, with the man in those last areas of divine establishment. Uh, but yet, you think, he says they should not, women should not get equal pay. And you think in the Bible of Lydia, the one who was a seller of purple, the one who had hired lots of other people because of the business that she started. Now, do you suppose that Lydia should say, well, now I'm a woman and I'm, I'm, I'm in this business, but because uh, I'm a woman, I'll take less for my products than the man down here because he is a man. I should, I should take 20% less or 50% less because I'm a woman. We've manufactured all these things, but we'll not, we'll not charge the same because we don't want to get the same amount of money. I mean, far be it from me, a woman, to actually earn as much as that man down the street the same, the same business. Nonsense. Lydia charged a wage and she got, excuse the phrase, a, a man's wage. She got equal pay for equal work. What about Priscilla? What were Aquila and Priscilla uh, as to occupation? Tent makers, just like Paul. Now, do you suppose if Aquila put in all the time, and, uh, and uh, I mean, uh, Priscilla put in all the time, and here was uh, Aquila, and both of them made tents, all right? And uh, they're selling them. Do you think that Priscilla should sell hers for less because she's a woman than, than Aquila? Do you think if it's the same tent, the same amount of time, it's on the open market, and, and for some reason Aquila said, well now, I better charge a little less for this tent because I, I don't want my husband to feel threatened. No, nonsense. She should get exactly what the man charged. She did the same amount of work for the same product. Now, I understand that um, that um, that is not going to be popular with the people we're talking about, but I think that's what the Bible talks about when he's uh, when God says equity. There's an equity, which means equal pay for equal work, regardless of the person. So um, we'll move on here because we want to look at some scriptures, but here are some of the other things that were brought up in this seminar. I, it takes a village. There is a criticism of, um, of Hillary Clinton. And uh, you're right, she deserves it. However, whenever I brought up the business about other religions, that was poo poo, oh, we don't, we don't criticize other religions. We criticize the politics, but don't criticize other religions. Where does Hillary Clinton say that she got her socialistic ideas to write the book, It Takes a Village, from the United Methodist Church that she attended in Northern Illinois. What church was it when Little Love, yeah, was, what was his name, Elian, forget his last name. What is it? Gonzalez. Elian uh, Gonzalez. Who was the religious group that mediated with Castro? 
good, good Goombati is with Castro. It was that the the woman who was in charge of that um, uh, diocese, whatever it is, in Miami from the United Methodist Church. She was the mediator. Why? Because their theology is Marxist theology. Again, some more or less, but that's exactly what it is. It's socialist uh, theology. The social gospel came from, from these people. And on and on we go. But we're not supposed to criticize that. Oh, don't say a word about the religion. We just hit the politics uh, of it. All right. And uh, uh, the next J was jails and, and prisons. Uh, this uh, particular fellow believes that because Israel had no jails, we shouldn't have jails, and that we should do things exactly like Israel. Now, it's not that you wouldn't like to, to do that, but what did Israel do? They had a threefold uh, punishment. One was capital punishment. Uh, you uh, died, you got either stoned or you were burned at the stake. And, and that's fine. And, and I always say that. Oh, let's, let's do that. Let's have a good old stake burning. <laughs> this reminds me of the old Three Stooges uh, thing where Curly was asked, uh, but do, you want to, do you want to have a, be burned at the stake or do you want your head chopped off? And he said, I want to be burned at the stake. And Moses says, burned at the stake? Why? He said, because a hot steak's better than a cold chop any day. Well, anyway, yes, sir. I know you women don't like the Three Stooges, but uh, that's, that's my education. But, but uh, that's what happened. You either got stoned or you got burned at the stake. You got flogged, 40 stripes or less. Or you made restitution, eye for an eye, that, that type. Yeah, they didn't have jails. This, this was their system. The problem is, we're not living under a theocracy. Uh, we are not living under that system. We're not living under a system where, where the nation itself was in a covenant relation with God. Where the men were appointed of God and empowered by God for that purpose. We're not living in, in that uh, type thing. He even gave an illustration about, well, what was Israel to do if they found a body that, uh, that was in the field? And uh, there was a suspicion of foul play. They would take and they would measure to the closest. They would take three cities and they would measure the one closest to the body. They would go to that city and begin their investigation. And if it, uh, they didn't get to the information that they needed, they would go to the leaders of the city and say, come out of the city and pray with me uh, to ask God to forgive us because God, now here are his words, holds the whole community responsible for that murder. Now this is where he's getting to. That if somebody murders in, in the nearby area here and we, do, we don't absolutely call upon God to find the, the murderer and the like, that we're as responsible for that murder as the guy who killed. And you know what I say to that? Nonsense, fooey, baloney, I don't believe it. Uh, but that's what you're supposed to do. Go to the nearest city and call the leaders out and pray to God. Now, I think of our own community here and some of those in authority. Some are atheists, some are agnostics, some go to other churches, some are very nominal Christians. Do you suppose we could get them together in our community for a prayer session and say, well, we found this body in the field. Oh, dear God, reveal to us who was the murderer so we can rid ourselves of evil uh, in, the, in the land. Nonsense. They, you know, they, would, they would look at you, oh, come on, what, what are you trying? And yet, that's what this man wants us to do. He wants us to, in effect, put the requirements that God made for Israel. Yes. All of those leaders were in covenant relationship with God. All of those leaders had to obey commandment one or at least should. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. All of those leaders were related to God differently than Gentile leaders in the nations of the world today in this age. They're, it's different. And you cannot do this. It's not an apples to apples uh, comparison. You can't bring it over. Yes, some things are the same. Some things are similar, but some things are decidedly different, like the leaders being 
called of God and that, that they can pray and you find out who murdered uh, somebody. So, takes us uh, uh, then uh, to K. We're, we'll deal with judges here just a little bit and, and leaders. You know what K was? Ku Klux Klan. Okay, and I'm sitting there. Who likes fighting? <laughs> okay. Now, well, oh, what about why? Why do I have to here? I'm for Bible study here. Why do I have to think of this group? And uh, one of the reasons was is because he's down the line here. He's going to talk about uh, racism. And uh, in fact, uh, N was Nazism, and R was racism. And uh, what he was saying was, is that today the dispensation of grace, at least he did say that, that uh, everybody uh, is invited to be part of the body of Christ and, and God is not a racist. But the way that he presented it was that God is never a racist. And I, I, you know, I felt so I, my hand going up, and I said, "Wait one second here." At the Tower of Babel, who did God give up? The nations of the world, and who did He call? Abraham. And what did He promise Abraham? That through your seed, that's racist. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the twelve. Through your seed, your seed is going to be my chosen race. And, uh, and if we don't understand that, then we don't understand what God is doing. In this dispensation, God is absolutely not a racist. But in past dispensations, he absolutely was. And you can name them. If you're going to be uh, a high priest and minister in the inner parts of the temple, you have to be of Aaron's seed. You have to be his descendant. And if you want to be the other priest, you have to come from the tribe of Levi. He is, he is absolutely discriminating against all other genetic uh, formulas for a group of people, to that group. Uh, if, you, if you want to be one of his chosen, you have to be a saved Jew, one of the 12. As a matter of fact, the genealogies, and we've said this time and again, the genealogies of the Bible point to God's racism. Jesus Christ has had to be of, of the line of Abraham, of the line, line of Judah, uh, uh, and of the line of David uh, in order for him to be qualified. God picked that race, and if Jesus Christ was not a Jew, he could not be their Messiah. But that all points to God's distinguishing the races. As a matter of fact, it goes back uh, uh, past uh, Abraham to the three sons of Noah. Remember that incident? You have Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And which one came out of that that was blessed through his family and his race? It was Shem. Now the other two could find blessing as well, but only in their relationship to the race of Shem. Other than that, God gave up the, the nations of the world till we come to the dispensation of grace, but that's a different story. All right, uh, he also, uh, the letter P was, uh, was poverty, and he touched on that. What do you suppose the letter Q was? Yes, it was. Uh, we'll just call it homosexuality, but he, he used uh, that word. And, uh, quoted uh, some various uh, things there. Now again, you, you want, you, you have to understand what, what this man is after. We do not believe in homosexuality. We teach against it. We see what God does and how he hates it. But we are not uh, against the homosexual where we would use vulgar terms. Because the whole idea is, is not to um, make them mad. The whole idea is to get them to listen to the solution for their problem. What is the solution? Jesus Christ. That's the solution. 
But uh, this guy goes on the talk show host, uh, the talk show uh, shows with um, the various hosts. And it's all the Hannity and Combs, the O'Reilly Factor, all those uh, the, uh, big name uh, talk shows that are out there that people watch. And he is an invited guest, and he uses that terminology. Rather than saying, look, uh, we don't like the sin, but we are concerned about the sinner. And that we would hope that they would change their lifestyle by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's a solution. Gracious, kind, not condoning the action, but at the same time uh, uh, saying a solution for their problem. Oh no, we've got to use the Q word uh, uh, here. And I think uh, that that's, uh, that's wrong. He then hit on uh, uh, socialism and, uh, and trees. Uh, they didn't, didn't all make it all the way down to the alphabet. But let's, let's go back in the scriptures to um, the book of Exodus, chapter 18. And uh, I, meant, I had something given to me th this morning, and uh, I meant to, to read it. It's really good. But I'm gonna, I think I want to save it uh, for the next time. Is, is that, that's okay. Uh, if, if it is needed for personal devotions, <laughs> I'll make a copy and read it for next time. Um, but here's one of the things that this man wants to do. He says, that, and we uh, touched on it this morning in Romans 13, where God says uh, through Paul that authorities are ministers of God. Now, he wants to make all the ministers of God, the judges, the police officers, the prosecutors, and that sort of thing, godly. Now, okay, but wouldn't it be nice? The problem is, we're not going to do it unless we get them saved. And we're not going to get pe those people saved. We can witness to them. Some of them might be saved. But uh, in our lifetime, we're not going to save the whole judiciary and the whole constabulary of the United States of America. It's just not going to be. But uh, he wants them to be godly apart from God. Now, one of the things is, he says, well, now, if you look to Israel, their leaders were all godly. I'm saying, hey, that's, that's true. But it's, um, it's a different system. Verse uh, number 21 in Exodus 18. This is what Moses did. And uh, it says, Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God. And you ask yourself the question, how many, even on our own little uh, area here, how many of our judges and, and police officers and the like would fear God when the scripture says that for an unbeliever there's no fear of God before their eyes? You see, probably very few of them fear God in, the, in the, the biblical sense of fearing God. These men feared God. Why? Because they had come up out of Egypt and they saw what God did in Egypt. They saw what God did, did in the wilderness and providing for them. They're about to see God give them the law. And many of the men that were appointed were godly men because they feared him. But when you take a, a, a vote and the most, most popular guy or most popular platform wins, these men probably or, or women don't fear God. But men that fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, place them to be rulers over thousands, rulers over hundreds, rulers over fifties, rulers over ten, uh, and, and so forth. And so that's exactly what, what Moses did. Yes. Israel had godly judges and authorities. But now, to add to that, come to the book of Numbers. Book of Numbers, chapter 11. These men also had a power system. And here, here's a, a, one of the things that I, uh, that I think he really doesn't understand because he was quoting the Ten Commandments and I was saying these are moral laws well no some of them like the Sabbath it's just symbolic and like it's it's neat you get stoned to death for, for breaking the, the Sabbath something that was just symbolic and not all that important 
and uh, people were killed. And we said, well, but Jesus gave uh, the example of he was walking through the field and he gleaned, and, you know, there were exceptions to the rule, and he said, you circumcise on the Sabbath day. Well, there were reasons for that. But who was the member of the Godhead who told Israel when they had this Sabbath day command, who told Israel when they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath? Who was the member of the Godhead who told Moses, stone him to death? It was the same Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who inhabited the Shekinah glory as God, was the same one who became man and who did give two exceptions to the Sabbath law. But it was Jesus Christ who said, stone this guy to death. He broke the Sabbath. Now, another thing he said was, well, nobody can legislate against uh, uh, things like covetousness. And you want to say, all right, yeah, well, I mean, I understand what you're saying because it is an internal thing. But could God rightly include thou shalt not covet and then not be able to legislate against it? How could God legislate against covetousness, which is an inner, hidden, heart sin? How could he do it? It's called the spirit of discernment. It's give, giving people the ability to read the hearts of men. How did Peter know it? That Ananias and Sapphira had lied to the Holy Ghost in their hearts because he had this gift. No. Numbers chapter 11. And it says, um, gather me 70 men, verse 16. And by the way, this is the, uh, the basis for the Sanhedrin, the 70. Comes right out of the scriptures. The problem was by the time you get to Jesus' day, the 70 judges were corrupt. Uh, they refused to believe God. They, they, they weren't like these original first 70. Elders of Israel. Uh, to whom you know to be elders of the people, officers over them, bring them to the tabernacle. I'll come down and talk with you there, and I will take of the spirit which is upon thee, and I will put it upon them to bear the burden of the people. Now we have a power source. Do you suppose that God is going to come down with the judges that we have here in our community and going to put his spirit on them so that they can uh, read the hearts of men and help rule in, in this community? He's not going to do that. He doesn't do that in this dispensation. Uh, come to verse number 24. And Moses went out and told the people words of the Lord, gathered the seventy, the elders, set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took the spirit that was upon him and gave it to the seventy elders. And therefore they were now not just appointed of, of some man to the post. They were anointed of God to function. And unless you have an equivalent system for Gentile nations, you are never going to duplicate what they had under the nation of Israel. Now, what God did here in part, uh, he is going to do in whole under the, the covenant of endowment, which is promised by the new covenant given to Israel, that everybody's going to have the, the spirit and that, um, and that the apostles are going to be 12 judges accurately judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Why? They have the Spirit upon them. And the Spirit is going to aid them in their righteous and just decisions. All right, now, let's go to just two other places with the time that we have remaining. Chapter 17. Of Deuteronomy. <laughs> Sorry. S Sorry. <laughs> In the process, I tried to ask questions. Um, but I also didn't want to be the one to monopolize this guy's time because there are other people there. And, and uh, I, but I, I tried to pinpoint some things because... I thought what he uh, was saying was wrong uh, in, in some areas, not in every area, but in some areas. And he said with regard to perjury. Now, 
Perjury has to do with one of the commandments. And there's this, there's this um, fuzzy, uh, obscure idea that seems to, to come from him with regard to what were, what were moral sins. And I said, all of the, the first ten commandments, as well as some of these other things, under that economy were moral sins against, against God. And, and uh, so uh, we started talking about perjury. And I said, well, he asked the question several times, well, what is the, um, the punishment of perjury? And he kept asking people, no one ever said it. And so finally I said, death. And he said, no, it didn't. And I said, okay. No, it isn't, huh? No, he said. Now, mind you, that we, we were talking about capital crimes, and that is the category I was in. Capital crime. Perjury for a capital crime. So verse number 6. Deuteronomy 17. At the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. At the mouth of one witness shall he not be put to death. The hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death. Afterwards, the hands of all the people. So you'll, you'll kill him. Now, here is the thing. If somebody wanted somebody else uh, put to death, uh, and you lied about it, uh, that was one thing. But you had to have two people lie. And if two people lied about it and came and put their hands on the other person, say it was truth. Say they saw him murder another person. They would say, I'm responsible before God and Israel to, to put the guilt on the head of this man by putting my hands on him and saying he is guilty. And then they'd be the first to, to cast the stone. But if the man was not guilty and the witnesses came and put their hands on him, what did they do to that man if they put him to death? They murdered him. It's a Neat little way of legalized murder. <laughs> Just get you a few witnesses. You all, you all uh, connive together, put your hands on him, and you kill him. So, if there's a matter that is too hard between blood and blood, plea and plea, stroke and stroke, you take it to the to the judges, and uh, and uh, uh, what the judge says, that's going to go, and you'll do according to the sentence which they of that place of the Lord shall choose to show thee. And what is it? Now, if you come down here, verse 11, according to the sentence of the law which they shall teach thee, according to the judgment which they shall tell thee to do, you will not decline from that sentence, They'll show thee, uh, which they shall show thee the right hand and to the left. And if the man uh, does presumptuously and will not hearken to the priest that stands to minister or to the judge, that man is going to die because he's doing presumptuously. Now come over here to chapter 19 of the same book. Now note what it is. Verse 15 says, One witness shall not rise up against a man for iniquity to put him to death. But, and by the way, I've got a title in my Bible here, Death for Perjury. I don't know if it's in, in yours, but it, over the, this portion is Death for, for Perjury. What is the crime of, of perjury in a capital case? It's not eye for eye or hand for hand or tooth for tooth. It is life for life. If you were going to put this guy to death, get him out of your way, and you were going to try to get away with murder through the, through the, the court system here, it is life for life. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom there is a controversy shall stand before the Lord, the priest of the judges. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if, a, uh, if the witness be a false witness and has testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do to him as he hath thought to have done unto his brother. And so you'll put uh, evil away from you. Know what that included. Verse number 21. Uh, and thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. And yes, it's true. Not every case of perjury was dealt with with death. It's eye, uh, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But if you, in a capital case... Uh, committed a, a murder or testified falsely to get this guy uh, out, of, out of your hair by killing him and 
the, the matter came up, an appeal came up before the judges and the priests, and they found out the guy that testified falsely, the perjurer, was the one who, in effect, was put to death. The same thing that he thought to do to the brother, his Jewish brother, was done to him, and that meant uh, that he was put to death. 